probably time to introduce you to something that I'll use throughout the semester, and that is butter. All right, butter is what I use as my stand-in for energy, because I think it's a really good way to think about energy. In fact, some people have asked me, like, why not use a stick of dynamite or something? Well, butter has more energy density, about 10 times the energy density of dynamite. I love butter. Okay, I love to eat it. I love to talk about it. Here we go. So, you may remember from 105, and you may not, that's okay, that work is equal to the force times the displacement in the direction of the force. So for a constant force, this is very simple. You may remember problems like a box being pushed across the floor or something, and you have this pushing force of, say, 50 newtons. And maybe you move this box 20 meters, so you move it across a gym floor or something. And so the work that you have to do, the energy you have to put into it, is 50, 5 times 10 to the 1 newtons times 2 times 10 to the 1 meters. Okay, and that equals 5 times 2 is 10 times 10 to the 2 newton meters. And you may remember that this is, okay, this is just 1,000, 10 to the 3 joules. A newton meter is a joule. Okay, let's draw what the force as a function of distance looked like. Okay, so here's the force. Here's displacement. I started out at 0 meters and I end at 20 meters. And the whole time I am exerting a constant force of 50 newtons. So look at this. I don't know if this reminds you of anything, but it reminds me of something. It looks like a stick of butter. That's what you do when you exert a force and move something, and something moves. You are putting energy into the system. And so, you know, there could have been friction acting the other way that took the energy out of the system so that the box didn't just keep accelerating and accelerating forever. That would be bad. Um, but um, you used that much energy. It's 10 to the 3 joules of energy. It's the area under this curve. It's the force times the distance. Hopefully that's making sense. Let me show you. Um, so work equals force times distance. Let's look at something a little bit more tricky. What if you had, this is my favorite example, what if you had a bow and arrow? And just to make it easy, let's start with a recurve bow. If you know the difference, the recurve it's just like a stick with a string, right? And you pull the string back, and then you let the arrow go. You let the string go, and it pushes the arrow forward. Um, so the harder you pull back, the more the bow is stretched, and the more it doesn't want you to stretch it more. And so what the force as distance changes looks like is something like this. So at zero, it doesn't take any force to display. I mean, it, it just is there, right? Um, as you pull it back, though, it's harder and harder and harder to pull. Well, this is bad news, because my work is force times distance. What force am I going to use? It changes as time goes by as I pull this bow back. Well, what you can do is you can zoom way in, I'm just going to draw one of them. You can draw little tiny sticks of butter, right? This is some little distance from there to there. And if I multiply it by the force at that point, then it's going to give me some little amount of butter. And I can draw the next one, the one next to it. I know I didn't tell you that I was going to teach you a little bit of calculus. But I can just add up all these little sticks of butter and I can get the total amount of butter that it takes me. What you find is it's just the area under this curve. That's how much butter it takes to pull the arrow back to this point. Uh, pull the string back that far. Okay, and um, you may, there are some tricks here. You can kind of chop it off here, bring this piece down to here. It fits like a puzzle. So what you do is you find the average force. This would be some average force multiplied by the total distance that you 
pulled the bow back. And that tells you how much butter there is stored in that bow string, bow and string combination. When you let it go, that energy is going to be transferred to the arrow. And that's what gets the arrow to have some kinetic energy. Well, this is bad news because have a look right here. This is where you're aiming. You have this wicked huge force that you're pulling against. And the strain is going to make you shake a little bit. It's harder to aim with a recurve bow than a compound bow. Let me just show you what I mean. So with a compound bow, um, I don't know if you've ever had the experience of pulling one back, but this is what it feels like. It's really, really, really hard, and then all of a sudden, the way it's designed it makes it easy. You get past this hill, this the top of this mountain, and suddenly the force required to pull it back gets less than it was before. Can you see uh, the advantages here? For the recurve bow, to get that same holding force where you're aiming, you could only pull it back that far and you'd have this much butter to transfer transfer to your arrow. Here you have all of these little sticks of butter that add up and you have a huge amount of butter, amount of energy to transfer to your arrow while you are only holding with this amount of force. It's a smaller force than you were um, with the recurve bow. So this may seem silly, it's just bows and arrows you say but we're going to see during this class, we're going to see energy and how useful it is all over the place. We're going to see that you can store energy in, um, in, say, a charged particle. There might be a hill that looks like this. Okay. Oh, actually, this reminds me of something. This is what, um, what ATP... This would be ADP, maybe you know this from biology. And this would be when you add that third phosphate group, this is ATP. So you have to do some work to get the third phosphate group on there, but then it's stable, or kind of metastable, because if it goes out of this, it's going to fly away. If it finds a way off of ATP, it's going to fly away. That, that third phosphate group has now stored energy that you can transfer to different parts of the cell and when you release that energy you can use it to do good to do work by say pumping ions across the cell membrane or um, you know powering some little motor that's gonna make the cell go through the water or something if it's a bacterium anyway so this may seem stupid talking about bows and arrows and butter in the same sentence even but really, it's a powerful way to think about it as you push something, if you, okay, this isn't exactly the same as this graph. I should have drawn it a different color. But as you push uh, something up a hill like this, I was pulling the bowstring up a potential hill, then eventually um, you store energy. As you're doing it, you're storing energy or just giving kinetic energy one way or the other to the thing. All right, well, hopefully this has been a helpful review of, of energy. Energy is the ability to get something to move or to do something. That's what energy is. And we're going to find out later on in this class that energy is actually um, can be interchanged for mass. You've seen the equation before, e equals mc squared. This is for something that's not moving. For things that move, it's looks like this and what you find is that the faster you get something moving the more kinetic energy you put into something this gamma factor gets bigger and it's as if the mass is increasing as you increase your speed it's really crazy it's also true that as you take this phosphate group as you give something potential energy it gets more massive as well and what we find is that the universe is basically on this weight loss diet. Everything in the universe wants to have the smallest mass that it can. And so why the phosphate 
is not completely stable here and why it will roll away if it has the chance is because it weighs slightly less here. I know this is probably too much too soon, but what they told you about conservation of mass is not true. If you put energy into a system, you are adding to its mass. And um, it goes the other way, too. If you can find some way to convert the mass that's stored in something into energy, it, it can work that way, too. So combustion is an example of that. You're taking some of the mass, some of this energy that's stored in the bonds of the, of the molecules, and you're converting it to energy. Um, that actually turns out the chemistry, the chemical combustion, turns out to be small potatoes compared to something that we're going to learn about later on in class, which is nuclear energy. And there, instead of lo losing, say, a billionth of your mass, of the molecule's mass, you're lo losing something like a part per million. It's, it sounds like it's not that big a deal, or even into the thousands, you know. Um, so it's... Uh, um, it's like a million times more mass gets converted into energy during these um, these nuclear reactions. Anyway, I'll stop talking. Sometimes I'm I'm uh, a little bit antsy to tell the whole semester in a single lecture, but this is where we're headed. We're going to see that mass is not conserved, and neither is energy. But mass and energy together are conserved. You can switch them one for the other.